Welcome to the pew. Welcome to the pew, as is shown by the commercial, I mean, by the cartoon that is drawn by... Uh, we got this from Claudia Grewal, who uh, said in an email that her six-year-old daughter drew it because her mom watches the pew every morning and the kid was yelling, Welcome to the pew! So she drew, she drew a little image. That's of, cute. <laughs> and I got, I got this. Hey, can you see that? Um, image from uh, a, a, another pewer, uh, Kristen, and um, and then there's the uh, there's the, the cartoon from yes. Daniel Feel who uh, made us look like characters from The Walking Dead, I think. With a wide nose, I'm in my part. Actually, you look kind of handsome in, in this, I think. I still think I look like a zombie. A well, a handsome zombie. A blood eating zombie. A handsome blood eating <laughs> zombie, and. Um, so, uh, and from there, <laughs> from, from speaking of handsome blood-eating zombies, we were talking about Peter Gaish and the nightclub owner of uh, Limelight and then subsequently Tunnel and Palladium and Club USA and how he used to cheat his employees out of their salary through this very fiendish strategy that he used. And Michael's going to explain it. Okay. Um, actually, it's more common than... I thought at the time. But what happens is, say Monday is payday. After about a month, uh, Peter would come in and say, or issue a, le issue a statement and say, um, we're being, we're, the accounting office is being redesigned and um, uh, uh, payday is now Tuesday. Then two months later, we would get another memo saying that they'd fired the accountant and the new accountant is coming in and they're doing things their way and payday is now Wednesday. And then three months later, there was another reason to make it Thursday, and then another reason to make it Friday. And by the time, you know, a year had come by, uh, there had been so many moves up one day that payday was Monday again, and we'd skipped a week. And so Peter saved, in effect... This millionaire club yeah, owner multi, who in multi hundreds of thousands of dollars a night yes. had to chintz his employees working for like 50 and $75 a night out of a week's of salary. Oh, which is a lot of money. It was like $250,000. So every, that's like somebody's salary, like right? more than somebody's salary. So every year, Peter could uh, count on a, a windfall, say, of $250,000 at no expense to him. Just, and in fact, he, he budgeted into his uh, earnings. You know, well, here's the $250,000 I'm gonna steal from my employees this year, you know. And then he wonders why people have a problem with him, <laughs> you know? Enjoy Canada. Yeah. Well, While it lasts. Yeah. Well, he, he doesn't, he's not enjoying Canada, actually, you'll be happy to know. He's um, broke and um, going blind. Well, I think it's uh, poetic justice that the person who was trying to cheat people out of their salaries should end up broke. It's, it's karma. Some would say. We'll be right back. Bye. And now a word from our sponsor. Welcome back to the pew. Welcome back to the pew. The pew. The pew. And bitches want to know. Oh, what do those bitches want to know? Susan DeFawi uh, wants to know uh, about the documentary. She said she was watching it and she saw how I uh, was demonstrating some of the costumes that I had made back then for myself and for Michael. And she wants to know if I still have them. And the answer is yes, I do have a whole suitcase full of those costumes, including the costumes that I showed on the documentary. And uh, she wants us to talk about how we made these costumes. Uh, we didn't go to thrift stores mostly. I, I mostly went to fabric stores because mm -hmm. there were like all these fabric stores in the garment district where you could buy, literally you could buy a yard of fabric for $1 a yard. So you, you know, you'd buy like five or six yards of fabric and uh, I'd bring them back to our house and I'd show them to Michael and if Michael liked a particular fabric, that's what we'd make the outfit of. Or sometimes we would go to a Shuru, the button store. Right. It was an accessory store where they had the most amazing, just shelf after shelf after shelf 
of you know rhinestone buttons and buttons in every shape and with every insignia. I remember uh, these rhinestone buttons that you bought um, for a vest that you were making. The, these were the favorite button, my most favorite buttons in my whole life. They were um, expensive at the time. I think they were like five dollars a piece or something. That's expensive for a button. Yeah, and we needed like ten of them, so that's fifty dollars just for buttons, and uh, they were about. The size of a quarter and just a huge rhinestone, like little rhinestones, right? Just really beautiful and it looked so good on, I think it was like a dark green um, kind of satiny. Do you remember the vest I'm talking about? It was like a green satiny vest with uh, I don't remember it. squares of like um, uh, images of like 18th century, you know, something. I don't know, but it looked really good. So, those accessory stores, uh, there aren't as many today as there were back in the 90s, but there are still some of them, and they're mostly yeah. congregated around Sixth Avenue between 38th and 39th and on the side streets. So, if you ever want to look for this stuff, that's where you would go. Yes. See you next time. Bye.